Well, again, good morning, River Church. It is, <clears throat> it's great to be here as always. You know, I was uh, preparing uh, this week and and last night for the sermon, I just, man, I was really excited to be here this morning, just to be going over God's word uh, with you guys. So I'm super pumped. Um, Pastor Randy is in Alaska. Some of you guys know he, he's been going once a month to Alaska, and so he'll be back next Sunday. Um, but he misses you guys. He, uh, he loves you guys. I got a chance to talk to him uh, this week. And uh, yeah, he'll be back next week, and he's looking forward uh, to seeing you all. Um, we're going to continue our sermon series on uh, titled Everything Reconciled. And so last week we talked about loneliness, and, and, and this week we're going to talk about scapegoating. Now, what is <clears throat> scapegoating, right? I think we all kind of know what it is, um, but what exactly is scapegoating? Well, a scapegoat is a person who is blamed for the wrongdoings or the mistakes or the faults of others, right? So it's a person who is blamed for the wrongdoings, blamed for the mistakes or the faults of others. Scapegoating is when we do that to other people, right? We, we scapegoat others. <clears throat> we might make an individual or a group of people the scapegoat. We're going to talk about that this morning. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for letting us just gather today, Lord. I thank you on this cold day that, that we are still able to uh, just make it here uh, on this Sunday morning. Lord, I pray for those who were are unable to make it, Lord, whether it be uh, <clears throat> the cold, whether it be sickness, uh, whether it be... Um, just injury or whatever the issue is, Lord. We just pray for those who are unable to join us, Lord. Um, we thank you, Lord, for the technology that we have, Lord, and that we will still be able to share with them and, and send them the stuff that we uh, talk about this morning. Lord, we just pray over their hearts. We pray that as they are not in community with us this morning, that they, they just sense and feel uh, your nearness, Lord. Um, <clears throat> Lord, I pray that uh, as we go through uh, the sermon this morning, Lord, I pray that we grow through uh, through your word into your image, Lord. Lord, uh, uh, my power, uh, my ability to speak is, is insignificant, Lord. Holy Spirit, you speak through your word to your people. Convict us, encourage us, change us in the ways that we need to be changed, Lord, and just grow us into the image of of Jesus. And Lord, lastly, I'd like <clears throat> to pray over just our tendency to want to scapegoat others, Lord. Pray for our tendency to esteem ourselves above others, uh, to, to, to find value and worth and importance outside of you, Jesus. May we find all that we need <clears throat> in you, Lord. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> so I want to share a story with you guys. My uh, my first year coaching high school, I was coaching at Pace High School, and uh, and um, I was uh, well. So I was I was I was I was uh, coaching coaching high school football, and and I was a quarterback coach, and so one of the my responsibilities as the quarterback coach was to make sure that the footballs got to the game. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, I was, we have like 20, 20 or 30 footballs that we take to the football games and, and you get them all clean and you spend time brushing them and, and getting them ready for the game. You know, you don't want them to be too, too dry or too slick. And so you spend a whole bunch of time getting the footballs ready for the game. Uh, you have to also make sure that they're at the right, the proper inflation, right? They can't be too, too, um, too inflated or too deflated. And so all of those things were, 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 were issues that were on my mind. And so I got all the footballs ready. Again, this is my, my first game as a, as a varsity football coach. I get all the footballs ready, and I ask the person who loads. So what, what happens is you, you take a U-Haul uh, to the football games. And so I asked the person who's in charge of the U-Haul. I said, hey, man, I, I got all these footballs. Where do I put these footballs? to ensure that they'll be 
at the game. <clears throat> and he said, no, man, just don't worry about it. Just leave him right there by your desk, and I'll, you know, I'll put him in the... I'll put him in the U-Haul, and we'll be good to go. And I'm like, all right, cool. And so I did that, right? I had him all, my, the huge bag was, was right there by my desk, and, and I left him there, and I was like, okay, uh, <clears throat> this other coach is going to take care of it. And so we uh, load the bus, get about halfway to PSJ. We're playing in PSJ. We get about halfway to PSJ, and uh, <laughs> we uh, realize that uh, there were no footballs in the U-Haul. Um, <clears throat> and I was freaking out. I was like, oh my gosh, like I had them there. What happened to the footballs? They're not there. And so turned into this whole deal. Um, but when we, we got back, uh, I found out that this coach was saying that, that he didn't forget the footballs, but it was my fault. And so like the whole school, apparently one of my friends was telling me like, everybody was saying, Hey, that new coach, Billy, he forgot all the footballs. And I was like, I didn't forget the footballs anyway. <clears throat> so in that moment, I was scapegoated, right? I was the one who was like, that's the guy that was wrong. It wasn't me. Uh, and ever since then, like, we never, man, I was always on top of the footballs, but I was so just paranoid after that first event. But in that moment, uh, and, and again, the, the guys, it was a great coach, cool, cool guy, but, but in that moment, he did not want to, to take the blame or the, uh, have the responsibility of that fault. So he blamed it. He put that on me. <clears throat> and I'm not bitter, guys, I promise. <laughs> um, but I, I've also been on the other side of that, right, where I try to pass and deflect blame to others. And, and, and collectively, you know, since the beginning of time, we have struggled with this idea of wanting to blame others, right? We have uh, struggled with this idea of wanting a scapegoat, right? We want someone else to take the, the fall for our shortcomings. We want someone else to take the fall for our mistakes. You see this in Genesis chapter 3. Right, the beginning. Uh, you see this in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve, they sin and they're hiding from God, right? God says, and so they said, where are you? And, 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 and they're saying, well, we, we are hiding from you, right? Adam and Eve were saying, we're hiding from you, God, because we are naked, right? We, we're naked and we're ashamed. And so you see in Genesis chapter 3, God says, and, and who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And then the man said, Adam said, verse 12, the woman that you gave, uh, that you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. So even in the beginning, you see Adam deflecting blame to two different people in this passage, right? The first one is to the woman, right? It's the woman, Lord, that you gave. It's not my fault. It's her fault or it's your fault, but it's not my fault. <clears throat> All right, we want a scapegoat. We want someone else to take the fall or take the responsibility. Or right, we want to be viewed as the, the more righteous person or the correct person at the expense of others. The interesting thing is that uh, this idea, this, this someone else taking the blame is actually found in Scripture. If you look, we don't have, we're not going to pr project it, but if you look a little bit further, uh, uh, a few verses after this in Genesis chapter 3, right, God provides the ram that, that, that he kills and he provides the clothes for to, to cover Adam and Eve, <clears throat> right? In, in Leviticus, we're going to pr project this. We, we see them actually talking about scapegoats. Right? The, the difference is that this was an actual goat. It wasn't a person. <clears throat> Leviticus 16, uh, I, it's, it's a full passage on uh, the day of atonement, right? The day that, that we have been atoned for our sins. But I'm just pulling out from this passage the stuff dealing with the scapegoat. And so in verse 7 it says, Then he used to take two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting, right? He is to cast lots for the two, bo two goats, uh, one lot for the Lord and the other uh, for the scapegoats, 
All right, Aaron shall bring the goat uh, whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. It's a priestly duty that, that Aaron had to do. Uh, but verse 10, but, but the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. <clears throat> Verse 20, when Aaron had f has finished making the atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat, the scapegoat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all of the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task, the goat uh, will carry on itself all of their sins to a remote place. And the man shall release it in the wilderness. Right, this is to be a lasting ordinance for you. Atonement is to be made once a year for all the sins of the Israelites. And so, again, you see here that, that there was this goat chosen and they put all of, they confessed all of the sins of the people onto this goat. And then they basically sent this goat out into the wilderness, right, to die. And, and on it, though, on it, what, what was, was it, it removed the sin from the people and all the sin was then placed on that goat. And so, so that's what the original intent, and again, as Christians... We don't do this anymore, right? Jesus is our scapegoat. But, but originally, this was a good idea, right? This is how things were supposed to operate. The problem is, so we have perverted this idea. Right? In the Old Testament, they, they stopped blaming things and they started blaming people. With us as Christians, Jesus is our scapegoat. Yet we, we want to blame others and esteem ourselves in front of Jesus. <clears throat> Again, our, our problem is we've perverted this idea. It's, it's, it's easy to, 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 to want to blame someone else for our shortcomings. It's easy to kind of see where we rank and compared to others when we blame others for our shortcomings. Uh, again, it also goes beyond the individual. So we've been talking about just individual uh, making others, esteeming yourself above others, but it also goes beyond the individual. As a group of people, right, we do this as well. <clears throat> right, we, we are likely to fall into scapegoating when our groups, when our circles, when our friendships are primarily based on something other than Jesus. There is a scary tendency in human societies, right? The tendency to divide, right? We have a tendency to see how we are different from others, <clears throat> right? Even people that we formerly used to be cool with, right? We used to, to be tight with, we used to hang out with all the time, right? We try to find dividing factors, Again, we do this individually, and we do this as a group of people. In human society, right, in our society, scapegoating goes by uh, just different types of names. Uh, it could be the, the, the scapegoating mechanism or the scapegoating narrative. It's also known as a, a, a purification narrative, right? Again, this idea of esteeming yourself or your group above others, right? Blaming others for the problems of the world. <clears throat> and again, what happens is, is we create a, a value system, right? And then we look down on others who are not living up to our standards, right? We, we form groups, and then inside those groups, we form other groups, and, and so on, and so forth. And, and what ends up happening when we do this is, is, is we, we, we view the majority, right, the, the, the largest group of people as the normal ones, and, and, and the, the minority, the small group of people become the abnormal, the wrong ones. And then aggression is formed against the 
minority. All right, we become, as the majority, we become united together under a feeling of righteousness, right? We're better than the others. Again, in our minds, we are not the problem, right? It's the other people. So that's in society. We've also seen this in the church, right? White, white Americans in the past were engaged in maintaining segregation, right? We, we were looking for ways to divide. It wasn't what Jesus was calling us to. It was looking for ways to divide ourselves, right, in segregation, right? We, we were also in the, 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 the same approach uh, during uh, prohibition with, with alcoholics, right? They were the enemy, Right? It then became the people who believed in, you know, science and biology, right? They became the enemy. <clears throat> A few years ago, it was people who shopped at Target. <laughs> they were the enemy. Do you guys remember that? Right? You can't shop at Target. People who shop at Target are the enemy. Again, we create a clean majority and a dirty or wrong minority. We do this in our businesses, in our politics, in our churches, in our families. As a child in the church, we, we, would, we would have these enemies, right? We would have these issues. We would have these problems and, and in a very childlike manner, in a childlike way. We would look around and say, man, don't we have enough of our own problems in here? Why are we fighting with people out there? Shouldn't we be focusing on ourselves? So, <clears throat> scapegoating. What does that look like? What does that look like in our culture today? In the workplace, what does it look like in the workplace? Right, we, we may want to be seen uh, to, to have some sort of job security. Right, we may, we, we may want a promotion. We, we want to be liked, we want to, 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 to be viewed as favorable. And so, and so we, start to, we start to hang out with the people who are doing the right things, and we start to, to, to judge, and we start to form this group with them, and we, we start to like the things that they like and, and dislike the things that they dislike and like the people that they like and dislike the, the people that they dislike. <clears throat> the workplace, in, the, in, the, in school, for our, 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 our students and our high school kiddos in school. Man, it's tough. It's, it's, it's middle school, especially middle school, but high school too, it's, it's a place where we just want to fit in. We want to belong. We, we don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want to be made fun of, right? So we associate with the cool crowd. We like the cool crowd, right? We tease the people that they tease. We make fun of the people that they make fun of. We, we sit at the tables that, that, that they sit at. <clears throat> we dislike those that, that they dislike. What about in politics, right? If, if you are uh, just, there's both sides, right? But, but, but the, the more conservative, look at the, 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 the more liberal and be like, man, you guys are all messed up. It's all your guys' fault, right? We are the better ones. And vice versa, the, the more liberal say, man, you conservatives are all messed up. It's your fault, right? And politics becomes our dividing line. Right, sometimes in our families, at home, this sounds horrible, but at home we have this scapegoating approach towards some of our some of the uh, our own in our family. May it may look like me calling one of my sons and saying, "Hey, William, don't you know your last name is Garza?" You're, you're better than that. And, and making myself the ultimate goal, right? You're not living up to me. Everybody else here is doing it right, but you are doing it wrong. <laughs> and then in the churches, 
Or actually, one, one more thing, also in family. Sometimes we do this with our, our in-laws, right, or our extended family. Like, oh, we're cool, but man, your sister's side of the family, they're a trip, right? We're not going over there, right? <clears throat> a lot of s- snickering. I, I guess you guys can relate to, to that. And, and also in the churches, right, we, we get so preoccupied in telling people what's right and wrong that, that we just forget to talk about the grace that we've received because we too fall short all the time. We need Jesus. So with that, that's a long intro, but with that we're going to jump into our passage this morning. Uh, and <laughs> in today's passage, Jesus deflects the scapegoating narrative, right, when he draws attention away from the woman caught in adultery. It's found in John chapter 8. Now, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent right now. This is some, some uh, just stuff that I think we need to know as we're approaching this passage, um, some technical things, and we'll get back into it. But, but uh, <clears throat> there are some technical things on this passage that I would like to point out before we begin. <clears throat> you might notice, if you are uh, on your Bible, you might notice that, that there are some footnotes in your Bible about this specific passage. Right? Most scholars, and I say this not to, to raise doubt on the authority on the, uh, and the authenticity of Scripture, right? <clears throat> but, but, but you may notice there are footnotes in your Bible on this passage. Right? Most scholars today believe that this passage that we're about to read isn't in John's original manuscripts. But rather, it was later added to John's gospel. Most scholars, however, believe that this event really did happen, right? So John didn't write it, and so if you're looking at the authority uh, of Scripture and the inerrant word of Scripture and all of that, right, John did not pen these words. He was not under the influence of the Holy Spirit as he penned these words. But again, these, these, this event, many scholars believe that this event did happen, <clears throat> It has all the same characteristics of what's going on in Jesus' life. So if you read this, it's not like some random stuff. Like the stuff that you're reading, it it actually goes in line with what the rest of Scripture teaches. Right? The the passage doesn't contradict Scripture at all. That said, the question becomes, well, how should we, as Bible-believing Christians, how should we handle this passage? What should we do with it? And that's a tough question, right? That's a question we must ask. <clears throat> now, I believe, and we're going to preach through it today, so I believe that it is okay to preach through this passage because, again, it, it, it points to so many other things that we see in Scripture that are true. Right? It's in line with what the rest of Scripture actually teaches right john piper and i was you know I was, again I, I don't take this issue lightly right i, I was researching i was praying i, I looked up a, a john piper and, and he's if you don't know him he's like a famous pastor but but uh, he he says this he says uh, we should be careful to base biblical doctrine from this passage but rather uh, use this passage to highlight and illustrate themes that the word of god actually teaches on and that's what we're going to do this morning. And so with that, we're going to look at this passage this morning. Again, if you have any questions, if, if that doesn't mean anything to you, that's totally fine. Uh, but I just wanted to put that out there. If you have any questions, come feel free to ask me after the service. Uh, you can, I'll be somewhere here. Find me. Uh, my kids will probably be on my back, so you may have to talk to them about it. Um, yeah, at least he's not here today. We had a rough night of sleep. Well, so anyway, actually, Sarah had a rough night of sleep. Anyway, all that to say, um, if you have any questions, you can ask me after the service. There's also a helpful uh, link on uh, or an article on DesiringGod.org from John Piper's website. So anyway, <clears throat> with that, let's jump into our Bibles. We're going to be in John chapter 8, verses 2 through 11. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people were gathered around him. Right? He's, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group 
and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Right? And it's interesting because in this passage, right, there should be two people that were caught in the act, yet that they are only blaming this one woman. So technically, two people should be there, right? And the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question to trap, as a trap, in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus, right? So, so somehow, some way, this sentence, and again, the disciple, or the, the Pharisees and the religious teachers are always trying to, chap, to, to trap Jesus, right, to, to get his words confused. And this story is no different. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. <laughs> at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, no one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Again, this is a famous passage, a, a well-known passage. And as you see, as we're going through it, it highlights so much of what we constantly see in Scripture. In our passage this morning, they, they have this woman, they have her standing there, right? They're about to stone her, right? And they had her there as, as the scapegoat. She is the problem, Jesus. It's not me. It's not us, the Pharisees, the religious leaders. It's her. <clears throat> The scapegoating, right? Here Jesus doesn't condone sin, but, but he shows grace to the sinner. Something the religious leaders were unwilling to do. Uh, again, there is a, a tendency in our, in our societies, right, the tendency to look for a scapegoat, to, to divide even those with whom we were formerly tight with. So what can we do as, as Christians to fight against this tendency? <clears throat> right, to, to oppose scapegoating and, and to oppose ostracizing others, right? We, we must be, and this is our first point, we must be a voice to the voiceless. Right, the way of Christ, Jesus calls us to condemn these, these, these purification narratives, these, these scapegoating narratives, right? Jesus, in this passage, he spoke up for her. He was a voice for her. He redirected the conversation. Right, right. Jesus deflected this, this narrative, and he wanted to take the pressure. He wanted to take the heat. He actually could have been stoned in this moment. Again, he, forgiving sins at the end. He could have been stoned at this moment for blasphemy. Now, now what does this look like, right? How do, how do we be a voice to the voiceless? One way I see this play out in, in our life, in our culture today, is, is how we engage in gossip. How do we engage in gossip? Right? Gossip is around us. You know, just in my work environment for, for, for many years, you know, I've seen this happen often, right? There have been times where, where, where maybe one coworker or a group of coworkers are, are upset with another group of coworkers. And, and so in their anger, in their uh, just being upset, right, they begin to talk. And they begin to verbally cast stones at this other person. Right? It could be, you know, man, as coaches, it could be that one coach who made that bad play call. 
Right? I remember I was there once. I, uh, it was actually last year. I was coaching uh, a middle school football game, and, and I was calling playing. We were making a comeback, and we were getting ready to, to score, and all the coaches around me, you know, they wanted to hear what it was that the next play was going to be, and, and they wanted to see if we were going to score, and, and so they're all gathered. It was awesome. They're all gathered around me listening uh, as I call the play to uh, our quarterback, and then, uh, and then he throws a pick, <laughs> and then they take it back and score a touchdown, and... Uh, I was like, man, that stinks. And I look around and like, there's nobody, right? Nobody is around me. And they're all over there. It's like, man, it wasn't us. It was that guy over there, right? <clears throat> right. But, but we begin to 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 vent, right? And we begin uh, to 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 describe how much that we are displeased with this person. Again, as if to make ourselves feel justified or, or validated for. <clears throat> what ends up happening is, is we begin this scapegoating uh, process. Right, my question to us is, how do we engage in this gossip? Right? Are, are we contributing to the gossip? Are we throwing stones at the other person? Are we allowing the gossip to pull us into these relational alliances? Right? If I say the right things around the right people, I'm good. I'll be protected. <clears throat> are we finding comfort and security and, and scapegoating the person who is, is not there? Or are we being a voice to the voiceless? Are we redirecting the conversation? Are we trying to empathize and understand the person who is not there? How do we engage in gossip? Be a voice to the voiceless. Moving on. To, to, again, to oppose scapegoating, right? We, we must be real, our second point, we must be real with ourselves. The way of Christ calls us to consider our own need for repentance and personal internal work. Right? We, we must take ownership in this area. Our passage, verse 7, says, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw the stone at her. Here Jesus is calling them to turn their attention from the sin of the adulterous woman to the sin of their own lives. Again, as Christians, we have this tendency to, to elevate certain sins above others. Right? Meaning that some sins are worse than others. Right? We may look at homosexual, homosexuality and condemn that. Well, we're totally cool with, you know, just telling a, a lie every now and then, right? I, I do this thing, but I don't do that, right? That's bad. This isn't so bad. <clears throat> we justify our sin because we believe that the other person's sin is worse. And we forget that, that all sin, all sin separates us from God. Right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in Matthew 7, right, Jesus is saying, you hypocrites, first take the plank out of your own eye. Right, the plank, the, the big piece of wood out of your own eye. <clears throat> and then you will clearly, uh, you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. For all of us, instead of casting stones at others or, or picking the speck from our brother's eye, we should take stock of our own lives. Where, where are we missing the mark? What, what sin are we refusing to confess? In what ways are, are we distant or distancing ourselves from God? In, in what ways are we relying on our own righteousness and just completely ignoring grace? 
Are we being real with ourselves? Or are we taking inventory of our own lives? Moving on. To oppose scapegoating, right, to oppose scapegoating others, we must engage with grace. This builds off that last point, right? In, in order to oppose scapegoating, we must engage with grace. The way of Christ, being a Christian, calls us to the measure of grace, not the law. Right, this is hard for uh, a, a conservative, orthodox, Bible verse loving evangelicals to swallow. It was also hard for the Pharisees in, in Jesus' day. Matthew 9 says, 9.13 says, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Galatians 5, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 7, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law of the prophets. All right, again, engage others with grace. Right? So, so what does this look like? It's not saying, what's wrong with you? You are the problem. Why are you doing that? Instead, it's saying, I see where you're at. I've been there too. Let's walk through this together. <clears throat> right, over time, in, in, in the scapegoating, uh, as we look in the Old Testament, over time, the Israelites, they, they began to worship other gods while continuing the ritual of sacrifices, right? So, so they began to stray away from God, and they began to, to, to worship other gods, and, and they began to, or they continued to offer these sacrifices, right? They, be, they continued to do these things that they thought that the Lord Loved, right? They obeyed the law, but they did not display love towards God or love towards others. <clears throat> right? He he wanted he wanted their hearts. He he wanted them to love him. Right? It wasn't about doing all of these things. There's something ab about engaging others with grace, about being real, about being honest and transparent about our shortcomings that adds integrity to our message. All right, I'm reading a book about teenagers. William is eight, and I'm tripping out. I'm coaching. I'm working in a middle school. I'm, I'm around 12 to 14-year-olds all the time, and I'm like, oh, man, William is eventually going to be this age. All right, I got to figure it out. I got to start getting prepared. All right, it's crunch time. <clears throat> So I'm reading this book on teenagers. It's by Paul David Tripp. This guy's a beast. If you guys read any of his books, the guy's awesome. Uh, him and his brother, they're, they're studs. But, 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 um, but he says in his acknowledgments, he says that, uh, so he's writing a book about teenagers, and, and in his acknowledges, in, in, in his uh, preface, um, he th he's, you know, he's thanking his family for allowing uh, uh, him to write about their experiences. And again, showing grace about being real. He says, thanks for letting me tell the stories of our struggles. All right, so this book is just filled with stories of the way that they dropped the ball. He says, thanks for letting me tell the stories of our struggles. They have helped to give this book integrity. It takes a lot more work, but are we approaching people in condemnation? Or in grace. <clears throat> and our last point, to oppose scapegoating, right? To oppose this tendency to want to scapegoat and make others feel less than. We must rest in our perfect scapegoat. Is Jesus enough? 
All right, stop looking for other people to take the sin that Jesus has already taken. Christ's death was sufficient. Jesus is our scapegoat. 2 Corinthians 5 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Right? He laid our sins on Jesus. Our sins were laid on Christ. He bore our sins just as the scapegoat bore the sins of the Israelites. Isaiah 53 says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sins of us all. All the sins were laid on the scapegoat. It was considered unclean and, and then driven into the wilderness. It was cast out. The same thing happened to Jesus. He was, he was crucified outside of the city. He was despised and rejected by men. He poured out his life unto death and was numbered for the transgressors. I'm sorry, numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus embodied what the scapegoat represented, the removal of sins from the perpetrators. So my question is to us this morning is, is Jesus enough? Or is it, or is it like, Jesus, thank you for, for taking my sins, but you know, I'm going to go with this person over here. They don't, got, they don't got much going on for them. I'm going to let them take some of the heat. Are we ignoring Jesus' work on the cross for our behalf? <clears throat> so what does this look like to you? Just, just take a moment to think about, about your workplace scenario or, or about your, your school scenario, your school life. You, 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 you students in the, in, in the room. <clears throat> How, how are we, how are we uh, in our political life, our political involvement? Are we looking for others to scapegoat? Are we approaching these places with grace in our families? Are we coming alongside our kids and saying, son, it's okay. I've been there before. I struggle in the same way that you struggle. And parents, you don't have to have it all together. I think uh, our message is, is received better when we tell our kids that we just, we miss the mark too. <clears throat> and in our churches, are we looking at others in a judgmental way, looking at those not like us in a judgmental way? Are we approaching these people with grace, right? The same grace that, that we have received. <clears throat> all right, instead of instead of dividing in in uh, all of these different scenarios and all of these places of of of, of that, that we find ourselves in, let us unite in Jesus, right? Let us find unity in Jesus. Let let Jesus bring us together. And let's not let our our scapegoating tendencies pull us apart. Right, Jesus, Jesus is our foundation. Let us be a voice to the voiceless. Let us honestly look at ourselves in the mirror. Let us be real with ourselves. Let us understand that we don't have it all together either. Let us be a people who regularly repent and take stock of our own lives. Right? Let us be a people who engage others with grace. And let us be a people who rest in the security of Jesus' work as our scapegoat. Let's pray.
Lord, I thank you for, man, I thank you for this time. Lord, I pray over our hearts this morning is, is, is uh, just naturally, Lord, we look for, for ways to just divide ourselves. Uh, there are going to be football games on this, this afternoon, Lord. We're going to w- probably watch those looking at ways to divide ourselves from others. Uh, we are always, Lord, trying, to, trying to, to, to see how we compare with others and, and to, to kind of rate ourselves and, and how well we are doing. Lord, I pray against that. Pray that we find our worth, our identity, our security in you, Jesus. And pray that we measure ourselves not against others, Lord, but against who you have called us to be. And Lord, we fail at that all the time. Holy Spirit, Scripture tells us that, 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 that you will work through us and, and you will give us the strength and the ability to walk in ways that you have called us to. I pray that, that we, we do that, Lord. We rely on your power to do what you have called us to. Praise the name of Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of, of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I say this every week, church, I, I love communion because it's a chance to reflect on what Jesus has done for us. Right? It's a chance to remember what Jesus has done for us. Right? As we get ready to approach the table this morning, Let us remember that that Jesus' work on the cross paid the penalty for our sin. He was our scapegoat. We don't need other scapegoats. We don't need to condemn others. Jesus took all of that on him. Our sin was put on him. He did that so, so we can have a restored relationship with him, so we can be invited back into community with him. Let us remember that this morning. That's what we celebrate. Now, I want to, in a moment, I'd like to invite you to the table of communion. You are welcome at the table, not based on membership. Or it's, not being about, it's not about being a member of River Church. You're invited. You're welcome at the table based on relationship with Jesus could be a, a newfound relationship. Maybe this morning the Lord's just working on your heart and <clears throat> could be a newfound a relationship. Uh, I'd like for you to take a moment to, to remember what Jesus has done for you. And then I'd like to invite you to come, to come and eat. It's good for you. <clears throat>